Hello, everyone, and welcome again to the Soft Skills Salon, your audible think tank on soft skills. I am Diana Kaworski, your host. At the podcast, we say that the conversation is the currency of communication. And today, let's have a conversation with Stephen Shedletsky. And he is a leadership speaker, author, and coach, otherwise known as Shed to His Friends. He helps leaders make it safe and worth it for people to speak up. He is a sought-after speaker, coach, and advisor who has led hundreds of keynote presentations, workshops, and leadership development programs. Shed is the author of the book, Speak Up Culture, When Leaders Truly Listen, People Step Up, which is due in October of 2023. He specializes in the development of psychological safety and inclusive workplaces. Shed brings over a decade of experience as chief of staff and head of brand experience, training and development at Simon Sinek Inc., where he led a global team of speakers and facilitators. He graduated from the Richard Ivey School of Business from Western with a focus on leadership, communication, and strategy. He lives in Toronto with his wife and two children. May I call you Shed? Yeah, granted, you definitely <laughs> may. It's a delight to join you, Diana. Thank you for being here and thanks for making the time and for the pre-work that you've already gotten under your belt. So we can jump right into question number seven from our questionnaire, which is always a popular one, which is what does success leading others look like to you, Shed? Yes. So to me, leadership is not about catching more fish. It's about teaching and helping others catch more fish or more quality fish, but in their own way. Um, one of the challenges I think we have with leadership is we look around the room and we go, all right, who's the highest performer? Who's the most responsible? Let's give them a promotion. But yet we've totally diminished the fact that the skills and attributes or soft skills required to be a leader are very different than that of those who are best primed to be individual contributors. And so we'll often take the highest performing, most driven um, person and then task them with leading people who are worse off at them than the job that they used to be in. Mm -hmm. And it's very different and it's very frustrating. Um, and we often uh, resort to do it the way I used to do it which may not be the best way for someone else to do it. Um, so I think leadership is very much teaching other people how to catch fish or do the job in their own way, which requires platinum rule, not golden rule. So platinum rule is treat others the way they wish to be treated, which requires relationship building, empathy, getting in their shoes, what are their preferences, um, as well as helping people, you know, helping people figure out uh, articulate, claim what they want to accomplish and they want to do. And leadership is supporting them to move toward that and do that, even if it is against your own agenda as a leader. There's a whole bunch in there. I'm glad we started here. And I've got a couple of thoughts, if I may, Shed. I Please. love this idea. I love this idea of that transition. And it, it is a space that I end up playing around in, maybe loitering in with some of my clients between individual successful contributor and individual contributor who's had high yield, maybe outsized results of some sort, or has been noticed uh, either with, with you know, accolades or in some way. And that transitional space to leadership that you mentioned, and sometimes there's a lot of murkiness in there. Mm -hmm. So your point, however, that I, I like to build on and I'm curious about is if leadership is teaching and assisting others to figure out what it is that they're doing, and I know I'm paraphrasing, so please, please correct me. How do I learn how to teach others? When I make that transition from individual contributor to leader, yeah. how do I learn how to teach others? So sometimes when you're in a position of leadership, you may have prior experience in that role. Mm. Um, you, I think, need to, um, thinking what, what the right term is, um, 
you need to realize again that the way you did it may not be the way that they will do it at their best. And you need to sort of divorce yourself from it having to be your way. Mm -hmm. Other times, and sometimes some of the most effective leaders I've ever experienced lead people where they have no prior or very little prior experience in the domain of the people they're leading. And I think it's kind of marvelous because you literally have to say to your people, I don't know better. Mm -hmm. You know better. My job is to support, is to remove obstacles, is to ask what you need, to listen, to come to you, to learn your your craft. Um, one of my favorite leaders, he he took me on a tour of a, a manufacturing and distribution facility that he was 5,000 people reported up to him in his organization. Mm -hmm. And he looked at his direct reports and he went, don't know how to do their job. Don't know how to do their job. He bare, he pretty well had zero experience in nearly every single one of his reporting relationships. And he was a hugely effective leader because he's a great coach. He asks great questions and he knew his role was not to be better than them at their job. He knew that his role was to show up in a way that allowed them to be best at their job. It reminds me of a, a story. I, I teach at the Schulich School of Business on the executive side, and I had a, a colleague there who's retired long ago who was greatly impactful when I first started out. And he used to make comment about how I don't ever have to have had a shovel in my hand to be the head grave digger. Mm. And while a bit on the morbid side, the the idea... <laughs> was I think in fact in alignment with some of your comments about how in order to be at the leadership level within a particular specialization it does not mean necessarily that we've had prior experience that we've had our fingernails dirty or that we even have any firsthand you know knowledge of of the tasks at hand so I, I get that. And I, I I would say to you that there's space also between what we have historically thought of as leading versus those skills that might fall under managing. And sure. coaching has been one of those, not unregulated, but still one of those skill sets that has defined that space where we lead and certainly utilize questions and how we communicate versus managing for the tactical and, and more operational. Very important, but different. Yes, yes, important. You need both. A, a friend of mine, uh, Peter Docker, says that management is about dealing with complexity. Leadership is about creating simplicity, which I, I really like, you know, and I think on the whole, leadership can be about vision and inspiring um, and, you know, making people's lives and work lives better, um, not necessarily easier, but better. The, the, I, you know, just to play on this leader of grave digger <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> example, I still think it while, while you may never need to have a shovel in your hand, it is still important to come out of the air conditioned room and walk <laughs> the grounds and right. have a shovel in your hand. Should your team need you to, and you need to get in there with them, Mm -hmm. um, unless you know that you'll just make it worse and your responsibility is to find more people who can make it better. But ju just to harp more on that morbid no, yet good, right. good example. There's an optics to it as well, right? There's certainly an optics to it. Yeah. I have one um, one organization that um, we've worked with on an annual basis for a while who has an informal policy and I want to say a rather formalized habit of hiring at the director level from away. Mm. And I'm wondering how this fits into some of your thinking or if you've seen that otherwise. Yeah, and is is there more context you could or you're willing to share in terms of why they do it or what's the the well, reasoning? I can't say that I know definitively. As I said, I'm I'm there on, on an annual basis, so I've seen this as a pattern, and yeah. it's not part of of where I spend my time. So I can only assume from the individuals who have coached within the organization that there's an emphasis on other experience that potentially, from an interdisciplinary perspective, will enrich the leadership group. However. Hey. I'm being generous. Yeah. <laughs> Fair. I mean, um, 
typically a sign of a strong culture and organization is to have a leadership bench where promoting from within is good. (laughs) Um, And the value of promoting from within is you already have people who have experienced the, the, the culture, they know the norms. Um, It is hard when you all of a sudden are promoted into a role where the day previous you were friends and peers or colleagues, that's a hard thing to, to navigate. And I know a lot of people who have struggled with that transition um, because it, it, it's a change, you know, it's, it's as if, you know, if you're in, in business with a, with a family member, you've got to be very conscious of what hat you're wearing at which time, um, you know, and, and even with the, the small little team I, I have, I'm proud to say that I'm friends with uh, right now. I have one formal employee. We're friends. And sometimes he'll come to me or I'll go to him. And I'm like, I need your friend hat on for this conversation or, I, or I need you to straddle both. Right. right. Sure. Um, so I would say typically promoting from within is a, is a sign of a strong culture, strong leadership development, strong bench. Um, I just did work with uh, with an organization last week where they brought in a new CEO, and that was because the organization is going through a turnaround, and it needs a different type of leadership. Um, uh, it, it needed a refresh. Now, what's interesting, and Adam Grant referenced this study, and I forget the specific study, and I forget the specific uh, numbers, but I remember the um, sort of the the notion of it, which is if you take the highest performing surgeon and put them in a new environment, but they don't bring their team with them, the Mm -hmm. likelihood that they'll reach the same level of productivity um, and success is something like 5%. But if you allow that surgeon to bring their team with them, their likelihood of of uh, getting back to that level of success and productivity is something like 95%, which means we live in this society where we so often laud the rock star, the hero, the individual, but that's just not our human experience. Um, in anything complex, we typically need teams. Uh, and though there might be one person who gets, or, or a few people who get inordinate credit, um, it's always a team. And mm-hmm. so, so yeah, I would, I would love to, there. I'm sure there are reasons um, to, to obfuscate that rule, but typically I would like to see a lot of leaders promoted from within. I think it's a sign of good leadership bench strength and strong leadership development. I like that turn of phrase of, of a leadership bench. The um level at which this organization is bringing in folks from away is the director level. And so unlike most C-suite positions, there are multiple directors. So I I don't know if, you know, we can speculate a, a clean link in terms of the impact. However, I can tell you that if you have as a person uh, you know on staff within this organization if you have seen that level being brought in from away i think that not only culturally but that there's an opportunity in terms of the optics of people's career planning or even their thinking about whether they're aspirational or 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 not and yeah. to your point you know when you do come from away there is a learning curve of course yeah um, but it's that learning curve versus going from friend to leader. To sure. Kind of, yeah. I heard, sorry. I had I mean, a comment just, from someone yeah. I, I worked with recently saying how they themselves had gone from, as they had been promoted, that they were going from friend or peer and they were trying to get to leader, but they were stuck at manager. Mm. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. I mean, one of the things is, Though, though management and leadership are different, I still think leaders, uh, managers can and should show up to lead. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, leadership is not a title or an adjective or a noun; it is a verb. It, you know, it's a set of behaviors. If people are following you, you're typically leading. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but it's it's an interesting sort of thought of directors are typically hired from. Cut, you know, come from away, which isn't a, a wonderful uh, 
uh, uh, theatrical play as well. Great story. I'm glad you um, got the reference. Chad. Oh yes, oh yes. I've seen it. A little gander there. Um, so, but yeah, it's it, you know. So one of the things that I've also seen happen in organizations, especially recently, is when you open up a senior leadership role, hmm. and then people. Uh, apply and interview it internally because as soon as you apply and begin to interview for the role, you begin to act into it and you you try it on. Mm. And what we've seen as well, and again, I don't know the stats on this, but I've heard anecdotally that when you when you try out for the role and you don't get it, you often leave. And so it's it's just an interesting notion of, yeah. uh, I mean, and, and I know, so uh, my f- my first corporate experience was mm-hmm. I was an intern at the then Knightsbridge Leadership Solutions when Leanne Davy oh. and Vince Molinero were were leading it, and I I I, so, I was so grateful to have that internship. It was like the the perfect sort of career trajectory. And toward the end of my internship, I had a a coffee meeting, sort of a very much like mentor career management meeting with Leanne Davy, who is still a close friend. Um, oh, wow. and, yeah, I, I love Leanne. Uh, she introduced me to my publisher. Um, we share a publisher, rather. Um, and Leanne said to me, our greatest consultants have industry experience. So the likelihood that we will hire you out of graduating is very low um, on a few bases. One, you're, you know, uh, I would have been m- more than... Uh, well, I would have been a year out from graduating. She's like, we can't hire a year out right now based on the size of our firm. Um, and she said, the best consultants get experience. That to me makes sense. Um, mm-hmm. The director level is 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 interesting, not right or wrong. It's just it's just interesting. I worked I, I worked for Knightsbridge for a while. <clears throat> Many that years might be ago. where we know each other from. <laughs> Maybe that's it. That's I it. was I was roaming the halls as Ralph Shudletsky's illegitimate son. <laughs> Of the summer of 2008. So if you were there then. Uh, no, I think it was before. I actually do. I think it was before that. But nonetheless, certainly familiar with those names and um, good to hear them. Good to hear them. Um, so let's take a leap over to our next question. And this one, I'm I'm sure we all have a chance to uh figure out how to work through together and it's where have you seen or experienced empathy in your career yes um i love empathy i'm a fan um (laughs) (laughs) it turns out i'm human um and i i've learned quite a bit about empathy i recommend uh rob volpe's book uh tell me more about that um and i've learned that there are different types of empathy there's emotional empathy where you literally join the emotional state of another. There's cognitive empathy. Cognitive empathy is you maybe don't have a shared human experience, but you can do the cerebral work of what it must feel like. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes emotional empathy can actually make a, a job harder uh, because we feel what others feel. Um, right. You know the the highly uh, emotionally empathetic stand up comedian not so good at their craft um, ver- versus a highly empathetic nurse or health healthcare practitioner or, or coach or leader like sometimes it can actually get in the way so so we can um, I think we can temper our levels of of empathy a little bit but empathy is really important um, I'm trying to think of have I seen or experienced it yes. Um, I'm thinking of one instance where I, um, someone that I'm working with still actively today, they, for all intents and purposes, are more senior than I am, though we view each other as colleagues. Um, uh, we both run similar businesses, and he's pulled me in to work with him. I've pulled him to work with me. But in this instance, I was working for him. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was something that didn't feel right that to me felt against his word. There was a gap between what he was saying and what he was doing. And it involved compensation and contract and this and that. And I I had a choice. Do I practice what I preach and build the courage to give this individual 
feedback um, or do I not? Um, uh, we, we were working together in person, though we live in different cities. And I'm trying to remember the sequence of events, but all I knew is I was going to be with him in person. Um, oh, yeah. I was with him in person the week before. Okay. Some news was shared with me that was counter to sort of what I expected or how I thought things were going to go. It wasn't just me and him. It was another colleague on that trip. And we were in the middle of work. It wasn't an appropriate time to bring it up. And I was processing it still. Huh? I went home, sat on it. I then decided I'm going to write him an email to essentially say, hey, this is how I feel about this. I know it's not your intention. We'll be back together in person next week. And I want to have a conversation about it. Um, and uh, it was hard for me to do, but I knew it was the right thing for the sake of our relationship. And we got together and it was the very first order of business that we spoke about on his insistence. And he was so humble and so gracious and didn't point a finger at, at me. He only pointed a finger at himself. He fully owned it. We didn't change anything. Um, and it was essentially just due to pace and a quick decision, but he owned the very impact it had on me um, mm -hmm. and he owned it. And it was just a beautiful, a beautiful experience of sort of both of us leaning in a hundred, a hundred and, because I could have swept it under the rug and it would have tarnished my relationship with them forever, but that's on me. Uh, right. How are they to know? Um, and then he prioritized it. He made it priority number one, owned it completely. Um, and our relationship is only tighter because of it. There's a lot in there and I appreciate the the example very much. So if if we try and peel back some potential meaning, in that email that you wrote, was the process of writing that email an important one for you to go through versus picking up the phone or texting? Um, because I knew we would be to, I, I wanted to have the converse, I wanted it to be a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that I knew we were, you know, I think the news was delivered on a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. I knew we would be back together in person the following week on another client assignment on a Monday or Tuesday. So I wrote an email, not uh, a, it was valuable for me to divorce emotion from fact and just sort of, I did have feelings around it. It wasn't an overly long email, but it was meaty. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I also, I, I knew that the individual is introverted. I knew that he would want to process it. I also knew that he's far more rational and cerebral than me. So I wanted to give him the chance to actually review and process it to make the conversation most effective. Mm -hmm. And so um, if we weren't getting back together in person again, um, I probably either would have texted or emailed or called to make it a conversation. But because we were getting together in person, it was a, it was a Sunday or Monday email being like, I know we'll be back together to again, together again shortly. I want to have this conversation. Here's how I feel about it. Right. Right. And the distinguish space between emotional empathy and cognitive empathy. I often ask people to consider the, personalization or depersonalization when looking at their choices in how to understand how to position how they are feeling or when they are seeking out higher levels of empathy from others mm -hmm. is is cognitive empathy then in your opinion where you've seen more skill amongst your clients or would you see say that to your anecdotal experience more more of us are skilled with emotional empathy uh like typically in the people that i experience are they better at cognitive versus emotional yeah oh interesting um i don't know if i've ever thought of it or examined it i i think it's ah uh, my my instinct mm -hmm. is emotional empathy is easier to access because it is based on our own or 
what we make up to be a shared human experience. Mm. It can be harder because we'll often bring baggage to it. So let's say you're having a struggle. I've also had that struggle. It, it, it could be easier for me to get in the box or in the jar with you as opposed to bringing some objectivity. Um, this is where, again, it's, you know, well, when that happened to me, like that's more advisor and friend-like than it is coach-like. So I think, A, emotional empathy is easier to access because it's based on a shared experience, but it can also cloud our objectivity. Um, I think cognitive empathy, because it is it is raised one more order, um, uh, you know, if you if you share with me an example of an experience you've had as a female leader, mm -hmm. it is automatically harder for me to have emotional empathy because I'm not a female. So mm -hmm. I have to work harder. I have to find something within me where I can relate to get uh, in your shoes, your experience. So that's my instinct uh, of the of the interplay of those two. And maybe with with your instinct, there's also space for us to speak about coaching versus giving advice. What mm -hmm. do you think of that relationship? Um, I mean, I've I have a coach right now. I've had a number of coaches over my career. I think coaches ought to have a have a coach. I think coaching is a great thing to have. Um, and, and I do coaching as well. I think there is as you gain more experience as a coach, there are definitely moments where you can be clear and saying, can I put my advice hat on for a second here um, with permission and say, hey, like this is advice um, or in my experience, right? And I think it is, it can be artful so long it is, as it is not the default and it is used in very strategic moments. Uh, and to also, again, um, say, I may not be right. This is my experience, but I, I, I have a, I have a mentor advisor thing to share with you rather than a, a coaching question. And mm -hmm. I think it can be a really valuable. Is that perhaps another platinum rule? Uh, in terms of treating others the way they wish to be treated? <laughs> yeah, there is that the only platinum rule? <laughs> well, I, I think sometimes as as client in that coaching client relationship, all you think you want or need is advice, but the coach knows better. So though yeah. sometimes the, the platinum rule can say, this is what I want, the coach can say, I know that's what you think you want, but I, I don't want to let you <laughs> off easy here. Um, yeah, because you need to be aware of the dynamic of that relationship that uh, advice from someone you entrust as a coach. Um, you know, and there's, there's the, uh, Jonah Hill made a documentary with his therapist. I forget the name of it. It starts with an S. Do you remember it? I have, uh, I cannot remember the name of it, but I do know the, the document or documentary. Schultz or something. Um, here, let's find it quickly. The, <laughs> the, uh, Stutz, S T U. T Z T Z, um, and the irony because his therapist says, you know, you go to your friends to listen, and your friends give you advice. You go to your therapist for advice, and all they do is listen. <laughs> and 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 that therapist, his point of view is, shouldn't it be the other way around? Like you take all this cruddy advice from your friends, but all you want is your therapist's advice. So <laughs> I think sometimes. Uh, so long as we're aware of the power that we might hold in the dynamic of that relationship, it can be really effective and useful. It's interesting. I've recently had my own thinking expanded beyond the parameters of consultant and coach. And although it's not my expertise, I've, I've been learning about uh, therapeutic relationships. So for example, there's an acronym SUS, which you may or may not be familiar with, S-E-U-S, and it's used by psychotherapists, and it stands for Safe, Effective Use of Self, SUS. And I was thinking about SUS in relationship to cognitive versus emotional empathy as I, I think, and these are all very fresh thoughts, so forgive me, I'm thinking that perhaps safe, effective use of self may be a therapeutic relationship, which of course is not coaching, 
but that maybe it's where intentionally leading with cognitive empathy might bring the relationship to where there might be more trust rather than looking at the emotional empathy initially. I know there's a lot of newness in there, but it was really bouncing around in my head. Yeah. I, I, I have never heard the term safe and effective use of self. I love it. And oh, take it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, and I, I think, I mean, what's great about that, especially for people who hold multiple roles, titles, whatever it may be, um, it asks us the question, it, it allows us to ask ourselves the question, how can I be of most use or service here? Yep. Um, which can allow you to transcend actions in whatever role you might be in, which could be parent, coach, manager, leader, consultant, so on and so forth. Yeah, no, it's it's a great little acronym. I'm glad I'm glad to share it with you. Safe, effective use of self. And as I said, not an expert, but certainly uh, a student of the of the idea. And I think it does have a lot of potential applicability. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Let's move on to our third question as we are having a great time. I hope you are. I know I am. And this is one of the questions that is near and dear to my heart because it's about soft skills. So it's this series of questions, actually, which is, do you use the term soft skills? If yes, why? And if not, why not? Yeah. So I used to use it. I presently don't. And um, I'll tell you why. And I'm also curious to hear how you define it. What are some examples for you as well? Or actually, I'll, I'll start there. How do you define soft skills and what are examples of soft skills for you? So it's a it's soft skills are the non-technical skills. They can be crucial to workplace success. They are uh, about how we can think and problem solve and communicate. They are reliant on on adaptability and certainly empathy. Um, you know, I've been doing this long enough that when I first used the term soft skills, I was asked about hairdressing, mm. <laughs> <laughs> which should give you some idea. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of language that is used to synonymously bring uh, meaning to different aspects of soft skills, whether they're referred to as power skills, human skills, communication skills, interactional skills, uh, professional skills. That one tends to be very trendy right now. Yeah. Uh, the relationship that I have with soft skills. And as I've, I've said more than once, I'm not married to the term and I'm, I'm always interested in, in growing. I'm not yet outgrowing the soft skills piece. However, yeah. I'm uh, very much interested right now in the analysis of some of the well-entrenched thinking that at a societal level, there's a narrative there that there is a lesser than more than relationship between what we have classically defined along feminine and masculine lines. And even that continuum in 2023 has been greatly challenged by how people are identifying and or um, how they would prefer the world to acknowledge them in yeah. a variety of ways. So I'm not yet convinced that soft is less and I'm going to keep that lens because if we bring that meaning, especially in a world where there's an AI that is, for many of us, uh, putting a new spotlight on what human means or does not mean, then if soft was ever less, which again, I'm not sure, uh, mm -hmm. it's out no longer. So that's that's some of my thinking. Yeah, yeah. Um, great. So, Okay. So I don't presently use the term soft skills. Yeah. And the reason I don't use it is because they're not soft. They're very hard. <laughs> they're hard to do. They are hard to, to practice. Um, I, I then started calling them human skills. And oh, then yeah. I, I was introduced to Rich Devinney. Um, Rich is a retired U.S. Navy SEAL. I work very closely with Rich. He's written the book called The Attributes, and I love calling them attributes. So there's skills and there's attributes. So skills, we are not born with skills. They are learned and can be taught. Um, skills are like riding a bike, walking, 
talking, listening is a skill um, uh, in the context of being a SEAL, shooting a gun, right? Um, yeah. uh, all these things are skills. We aren't born with them. We can learn them. It's easier to test, measure, and assess. Um, uh, yeah. Um, uh, attributes, we are born with these. Um, uh, we can even sense in our young children their level of resilience, adaptability, patience, right? They're more innate. Um, we can develop attributes. Uh, mm -hmm. Think of attributes as like dimmer switches. We all have them. Like all human beings are adaptable, but you might be a nine out of 10 in adaptability and I might be four. It doesn't mean that I don't adapt. It just takes more energy and work for me to adapt. Maybe a thoughtfulness uh, even, yeah. Yeah, so we need, so, so in order to improve an attribute uh, or develop it, we need to have um, a self-awareness that we might be low, uh, or that we want it to be higher. Um, we uh, need to uh, be self-motivated to then improve upon it. And then we need to, this is the hard one, deliberately put ourselves in hard situations where it flexes and grows. So, you know, I could be skilled as a listener, but if I bring my listening skills, which we can teach and learn people how to be better listeners, if I... Um, uh, bring my skills as a listener without compassion and empathy, I can quickly use that skill as, as being a listener as a weapon uh, and to create uh, manipulation rather than genuine connection. So combining the skill of listening with compassion. Um, skills measure performance, attributes measure potential. So you might have someone who is underperforming in a role but they might have the right attributes to thrive in a different role. So I, yeah, at present, I'm using the word attributes, um, sort of these human characteristics right. that we all have them. We all have varying levels and we can develop them. If we know that empathy is important, we can do the work to, to build it, to develop it and, and, and put ourselves deliberately in situations that allow that muscle to grow. I'm so pleased that we've, approach this question because I, I cannot say I've heard the uh, attributes versus skill approach to it before. So that's that's fantastic. Something new for me to mull over. I have spent time in the performance versus potential uh, space mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there's so much that as someone who is both entrepreneurial as well as affiliated with universities that that I understand and that I intentionally practice in terms of self-awareness. I get that. I get the theoretical piece. I, I understand the importance and I try. I can't tell you I've figured that one out, right? I'm I'm very flawed, very comfortable with that. I'm trying. Uh, I get the self-motivated piece and, and I, I have a little bit more immediate repertoire of my own skills there. I'm really taken by the, the third point you make, because it is one that I often make through a, a different approach, but it's the exact same sentiment, which is do it scared, do it <laughs> and recognize or with discomfort awareness and self-assurance that the yield will often be, if not guarantee, if you have the self-awareness, the confidence that you seek or the um, self-information, the foreknowledge for the next time. Um, so I'm a big proponent of of doing it scared, which uh, I don't know if many people who are working in a role over a, in a, a long career or even several different roles on a full time basis, if they get enough opportunities in a classic job description to do that. And I often am mourning that on some of, on the behalf of some of my clients, hmm. because I see that they don't have the chance to do that. And then the other side to it shed it, then I, I realized that's, that's how I go about doing it. Right. So maybe yeah. they're, they've already found their Nirvana, you know, they've already. <laughs> yeah. It. A, a few things just to highlight that I love there. So one, I'm, you know, we hear the term fearless leader. And I, I hate the term 
<laughs> there are very few. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, fearlessness is uh, an overly idealized notion. And in fact, it's dangerous. Um, if you have a fearless leader, that's the one who's going to get you hurt. Um, fear is biological. Fear is vital. Um, yep. It's a modulator for risk. So, and if it weren't for fear, we wouldn't have courage, which you're speaking to as well, the, the deliberate courage to step into discomfort, which then on the other side of that can be or is growth. Um, the other thing, so if you've if you've received feedback twice, the same feedback twice, you have a pattern. Um, and then if you wish to take on that pattern to be like, ah, oh, like I just work with a leader to, to today who showed up in a team meeting quite arrogantly, you know, and something tells me he's received the feedback more than once that sometimes you can come off as overly self-assured, which is a strength derailing into a blind spot or a, a limitation or a weakness, mm-hmm. um, which then that leader has the opportunity to go, huh, I've received the feedback multiple times that I come across as overly self-assured. Um, I'd like to work on my humility, mm-hmm. right? Now, how do you deliberately work on your Humility, which is holding a more modest view of oneself, realizing you have strengths and weaknesses and are fallible. So that could be deliberately doing something that you're not good at, like on purpose, like hopping on a balance board in the middle of the ocean or whatever, just to give you humble pie. Um, so just a fun little, fun little example of that. No, and it's, it's a good one. And if, if I may, I was, I was teaching this morning about the value of pattern and I'm convinced that there is an enormous opportunity in general understanding that a pattern can be two instances. Pattern is a very little number. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so good. It's bigger than one. Yeah. But it can be smaller than anything else, like three or more. Like yeah. two is a pattern. And to, to go back to some of our previous comments, you know, if if I'm going to have the self-awareness to look at a behavior. And if I'm going to position feedback for someone else to hear that, if I can speak and shine a spotlight on the pattern, rather than saying, I like, I dislike, and all of the other it takes stuff. subjectivity out of it. It's objective. Exactly. We depersonalize. Yeah. And now we can actually debate, depending, or at least discuss what is going on with the pattern? Is yeah. there a pattern? I didn't know there was a pattern. Huh. And we're on the same side of what can be clarity or self-awareness or other awareness, but it's all because there were two instances. I I don't know what crusade, I would love you to join me, but I (laughs) spent hours talking about that importance this morning. And there's something there. There really is. Yeah, my my mother-in-law is a retired school teacher. And while I was never her student, I could just assume she was a good teacher. And there was a there was a lesson she learned in teacher's college some, at this point now, 50 years ago, where, um, maybe not quite 50, but 45, uh, where she was taught, if two or more of your students complain of the same issue, you might have something to do with it. And it could be your your teaching style, which by the way, need not be two students in one class. You could receive feedback and then the next year or 10 years later, receive the same feedback and you, my friend, have a pattern. Exactly, um, it's not timed. It's <laughs> Yes, and but there's something that you're doing that yeah. is ineffective or could be more effective for at least some proportion of the population and you get to make make the call is it worth it to flex and adapt and grow uh or do you want to make them the problem which you're allowed to do well i am delighted that we've provided i hope all of our listeners the opportunity to consider flexing adapting and growing based on our conversation and i'm remarkably appreciative of your time and all of the insights that you've shared thanks for being on the podcast my pleasure. And maybe for them to entertain that if uh, if, if if there's a pattern, they have a choice <laughs> to right. make a change. Thank you, Diana. Pleasure to join you. Thank you.